I'll wait just a minute again. Let's see. People always have trouble getting online. It's so when I see the number, I see the number keep on going up. When it reaches an asymptote, you. Uh... I'm about to say something and then I look down, it's gone up. Go ahead, sorry. Um, okay, thanks everyone for coming today um, in person and online for today's Beyond the Scope talk. Um, for the talk today, um, Hank Collin will be giving a talk um, about vacuum systems. Uh, Hank's one of our assistant directors here. Uh, all his duties, he probably takes care of the most instruments. So he takes care of a couple TEMs, XRDs, and he's gone roped into the Helix game recently. Yeah. So. It's a huge, broad range of a lot of knowledge um, on all the instruments. I think, I think you can operate every instrument in the building properly. <laughs> well, probably turn them on. So yeah, I'm a jack of all trades and master of none, as they say. Master of half, probably. <laughs> but yeah, that'll be great hearing from Hank on this. I think vacuum systems are overlooked. We say, hey, that's nice. SCM talk about all the cool stuff like an SCM from my side. You don't think about the back side of it. So it's nice to actually think about that and understand it a little bit more. So for this talk, um, if you guys have questions throughout, ask questions. If you're online, feel free to ask questions um, in the chat or in the Q&A as well. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Dan. So I uh, wanted to give a very brief overview of some of uh, vacuum technology and some things that might be helpful for people as they're uh, uh, working with vacuum systems. So again, I'm, I'm emphasizing this word basics on this. So I wanted to touch on some things, uh, just talking about vacuum itself, pressure measurement, pumps, how do we get vacuum, uh, and how does conductance affect us, and then a few bits on some of the vacuum hardware and uh, the effect we have on surfaces, particularly when we're trying to do ultra high vacuum work. So I've got put up here a number of resources. Um, I will put this slide up again at the end if you want to copy it, and I can always give you the information if you contact me directly. Uh, most of the material will be coming from this first reference by uh, Gerhard Leuven. Um, uh, it's an AVS monograph. It's not that recent, but it covers quite a bit of uh, ground. Uh, the book, si Building Scientific Apparatus, I pretty much recommend that any research group should have a copy of that in their group. It covers many different things, anywhere from mechanical design to uh, optics to electrical design. And it has a chapter on uh, vacuum design and vacuum hardware. So it's a very nice, concise introduction with lots of um, references in it. The uh, Handbook of Vacuum Science and Technology and the Scientific Foundations of Vacuum Technique are both like 800 page tomes of, uh, on vacuum. Uh, the book by Dushman uh, is uh, relatively old, but he really lays down all the theory that's needed for uh, vacuum science. And then the uh, handbook has a lot of useful information in it as well. And I took a bunch of things from the handbook. The last reference uh, is from Kurt Lester Company. I found this recently, and actually I learned a few things just poking around on that website as well. So there's some fairly uh, practical suggestions that they have on that website. So, okay, what is vacuum? Okay, well, first of all, we have to think about pressure. Well, pressure is a force per unit area. So, and that generally we talk about when a gas exerts pressure, but you can have water or anything else. And vacuum, we would call any pressure that is significantly significantly lower than atmospheric pressure. Um, and obviously in terminology, so a higher vacuum is a lower pressure. So when we talk about high vacuum versus low vacuum, a high vacuum is a lower pressure than a low vacuum. Two sides of the same coin, just different ways to think about it, but it get, does confuse people. So often I will try to use the terms a better vacuum or a worse vacuum to try to uh, describe the vacuum things. 
since we're talking about vacuum, what we want to be, we need to measure. And we will use different units for the vacuum measurement. Now, traditionally, we have used tor, uh, where one tor is equal to one millimeter of mercury uh, pressure difference, named for the uh, Italian physicist uh, back in the uh, 18th century. So atmospheric pressure is roughly 760 tor, which is about 1,000 millibars. So for the purposes that we're do working in vacuum, you can pretty much uh, call millibars and tor to be equivalent pressures. And then uh, the more recent unit are pascals. And I have to confess, I don't think in pascals, uh, but uh, 100 pascals is one millibar and 133 is uh, one millitor. Uh, that's wrong. 133 pascals would be one torque. I got my slide wrong. Got my millis and my micros. So talking about pressure ranges, we talk about rough vacuum as being sort of uh, from atmosphere down to about one torr or one millibar. Uh, and then high vacuum is from about one millitor down to about 10 to the minus seven millitor. Okay, so, and uh, then ultra high vacuum is anything below that. And you can go through with the kinetic gas theory and talk about and Avogadro's number, and you can figure out particle densities and mean free paths and all sorts of things like that. As well as the Knudsen number is basically describing flow. So measuring pressure, right? We have all these nice units. The traditional method was using a mercury manometer. And uh, these days, mercury is kind of frowned upon as a measuring device. So these are uh, pretty much for historical purposes only, but you just measured the height of the column in millimeters, and that was your Tor value. These days, we're using vacuum gauges that can be mechanical. We can use thermal conductivity gauges, and we can use ionization gauges. So if we think about the ranges that these things can work, mechanical gauges are for higher pressures, worse or rough vacuum. So if you see here, you have the U-tube, which is basically a mercury manometer, which is from atmosphere down to about one tor. And note that this is a log scale on the x-axis there. You then have mechanical gauges, a Bourdin tube and a diaphragm uh, gauge. Then below that, in a lower pressure range, you have what are called the thermal conductivity gauges, the thermal couple gauge and the Pirani gauge. And then you go into the ionization gauges for lower pressures than that. Now, the capacitance gauge, and I'll mention it, I'll show you in a minute, is a uh, variation on the diaphragm gauge, but you have a different way of reading the deflection of the diaphragm. So it has a wider pressure range. So the Bourdon tube, basically you have your vacuum here at the bottom and it's attached to a flexible tube. As you change the pressure coming in, that tube will deflect and that moves the uh, needle on the arm, just mechanical linkage. The diaphragm gauge is somewhat similar. You have your vacuum here coming in on the right and you have a diaphragm that deflects as you change the pressure. And again, you have a mechanical linkage to, uh, to change a needle on a gauge. <clears throat> now, the capacitance gauge is very slightly different. You're again looking at the deflection of the diaphragm, but now the, you've metallized one side of the diaphragm and it becomes one side of a capacitor. So, you can measure electrically, you can measure the capacitance very precisely and do better than a mechanical linkage. So that's why it has a lower uh, ultimate pressure range. So going from the mechanical gauges to the thermal conductivity gauges, if you think back to your uh, freshman physics, you have three ways of heat transfer. You've got radiative heat transfer, conductive heat transfer, and convective heat transfer. 
Well, at high pressures, you get the convective, you get flow of gas, right? Moving heat. At very low pressures where you have a vacuum, the predominant method is a radiative heat transfer. But in between the two, the heat it, through a gas, you get conductive heat transfer. So you can actually use the amount of heat transfer to infer the pressure level. But as you see from this diagram, it's over a limited pressure range. So the easiest way to do this is you take a heated filament, you use constant power, and you put a thermocouple on. So as the pressure goes down, you get less heat transfer, the wire gets hotter, and you just read out that, uh, that heat value, that temperature. This is a very simple design and is pretty common for these intermediate pressure ranges. There's a similar gauge called the Pirani gauge, which is using the same concept, but instead of using a thermocouple to measure the temperature, they're using the resistance of a wire, the R4. So as the temperature of the wire changes, its resistance changes, and then you're using a Wheatstone bridge arrangement to measure the resistance of the wire. But again, the temperature depends on the pressure and the resistance depends on the temperature. So you just calibrate these things. What is important to note is that the pressure readout also depends on the thermal conductivity of the gas. Helium conducts heat very well. Argon and the heavier gases do not. So these gauges are generally calibrated for nitrogen, air, right? So if you're using different gases in your vacuum system, like in a process or something like that, you'll need to make sure you have the right calibration for the particular gases that you're using. Now, getting down to lower pressures yet, below the level of thermal conductivity gauges, we switch to what are called ionization gauges. So we're going to ionize the gas and then measure the current that we have. And the current is then going to be proportional to the number of gas molecules that are in the, uh, in the gauge. And again, just like with the thermal conductivity, conductivity gauges, you have to be thinking about the gas that you're looking at because each gas will have a different ionization potential. So you have to calibrate for the particular gas. So as they, these gauges come off the shelf, they're always calibrated for air or nitrogen. So there are two basic types of ionization gauges. There's a cold cathode and a hot cathode. So what's a cold cathode gauge look like? Well, you basically just take several kV, put it onto an anode, which is sitting between two cathodes that are at ground potential. So if you have some gas in there, you'll get some spontaneous ionization. And now the electrons are going one way, the ions are going the other. But now we put this into a magnetic field. So now these electrons are going to spiral and have a very long path through this magnetic field. And as they're being accelerated towards the uh, anode, they're ionizing additional gas molecules. So we can measure now this current. And the, the uh, reason for the magnetic field is to extend the range of the gauge down to lower pressures when you have less atom, gas atoms in there to ionize. So these are usually good down to 10 to the minus seven, 10, maybe even 10 to the minus eight torr, depending on the gauge. Below that, there just aren't enough gas atoms for spontaneous ionization. So, we switched then to a hot cathode uh, ionization gauge. So here we have a filament that we run and we get thermionic electrons coming off, just like a light bulb or uh, a microscope uh, cathode. And there's no magnetic field here, but there is a potential put onto this grid, this uh, spiral grid. So the electrons will be emitted from the filament, but because the grid has so much open area, they don't go directly to the grid. They'll wind up missing it and then spiraling into the grid eventually. 
So they, again, you have an extended ionization path for these electrons. And these are good down to about 10 to the minus, maybe 10 to the minus 10 tor, something like that. So um, the drawback is if you expose them to atmosphere, you burn out the filament and you often have to then replace the tube. So you have to be careful. with it. Okay, so we can measure vacuum over quite a wide range. Now, the question comes, how do we make that vacuum? Well, we need to have some sort of device to develop a pressure differential. So as we're thinking about pumps, we need to think about the pressure range we need to get uh, for our ultimate vacuum. Um, are we pumping condensable vapors or corrosive vapors? Are they compressible, ionizable, whatever? We don't know. So, um, since a pump is maintaining a pressure differential, you have to think about what kind of pressure differential the pump can maintain. So the, uh, and then, uh, and I'll mention this again a little bit later, the, a pump is given a certain pumping speed. So if you look in the catalogs, you'll see that they're rated at a certain pumping speed, but there are conductance limitations for the effective pumping speed of a pump. Well, I'll just address this a little bit later on. So most of the pumps that we're dealing with are what are called positive displacement pumps, or they're compressing. So you're using some sort of a compression method to take the gas out of the chamber, compress it, and exhaust it to a higher pressure range. And once again, just like the gauges, the pumps have certain effective ranges. You can start with a water jet, a water aspirator, which is great if you're just trying to pull enough of a pressure differential to suck uh, 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 water through your uh, paper filters, okay? So used a lot. These are the little things that you attach to the faucet and just let the water go through and it produce a, a reasonable pressure differential. So at, uh, again, moderate pressures, you have diaphragm pumps, rotary vein pumps, scroll pumps, roots blowers, and well, I'll skip that for now, the compound pump. To get to lower pressures now, we will use an oil diffusion pump, a turbo molecular pump or cryo pumps, and then sputter ion pumps. Okay, and they all have different advantages and disadvantages. So most of the compression pumps we will use as roughing pumps or backing pumps. So we will use them to pump a chamber down to a certain rough vacuum level, or we'll use them to back up another pump that can, cannot maintain a high pressure differential. So uh, the most common then are the rotary vein pumps, diaphragm pumps, scroll pumps. Roots blowers are generally used for high gas volumes, so they're often used in process in, in, in industry. And then there are molecular drag pumps. So the most common and over the years has been the rotary vein pump. So you have your vacuum inlet and you now have an off-center uh, rotation here with spring-loaded veins. So as this is rotating, now you have this particular volume. And as it rotates around, the volume expands until you get to something like this large volume here. And then it starts compressing and then compresses out towards atmosphere or wherever. Now, these are usually done with multiple stages because you can only have a certain amount of compression per stage. Um, and then there is this gas ballast listed, which you notice is basically a little leak, which is going to reduce your compression ratio. Um, we'll, I'll mention more about this in just a moment. Um, then you have diaphragm pumps, which are basically just rubber membranes. Um, exactly the same principle as a sewage pump, <laughs> but except that we're moving gas. And these work very well. They don't have the same ultimate vacuum that the rotary vein pumps have, 
but the advantage is they're completely oil free. So you don't have to worry about oil migrating back into your systems. And again, these can often be staged with multiple stages. So the gas ballast is used on these compression pumps because as you compress the gas, you'll actually start condensing uh, usually water vapor or any other kind of volatile vapor. And in oil pumps in particular, you'll get the oil into the, the water into the oil and then it, uh, you start losing effectiveness. So they will bleed a little bit of air between the compression stages. And that does, does two things. It reduces the compression ratio but it also flushes the water out of the oil system so that uh, you can use that to periodically clean up the oil as long as you don't have too much. So, um, so yeah, basically when you have a pump like that, periodically you'll run a gas ballast and clean out the water and then close it again to get better pressures. So another type of compression pump actually has no moving parts. It's the vapor jet pump, also known as a diffusion pump. The diffusion pump actually is, has a bath of oil in the bottom and you have a heater down here. So you're boiling the oil. You cannot use it to make French fries, but it will help produce a pretty good vacuum. So as the oil vapors come up, they are then directed downward through these vents in the chamber and you get now a stream of heavy oil molecules hitting these very light gas molecules and imparting a net downward momentum to the gas molecules. Now these are good through a certain pressure range, but if you start getting too many gas molecules, you lose the velocity of the uh, oil molecules and they'll start to diffuse and go upward into your chamber that you're not, you want to keep nice and clean. So you do have to worry about oil backstreaming from this type of pump. And they will usually put some sort of trap, both water cooled and um, uh, liquid nitrogen cooled above a pump like this. So these big heavy oil molecules come out, they hit the gas molecules, push them downward, and then they condense with the water cooling on the wall, drip back down to the, uh, to the boiler at the bottom and are recirculated. Uh, these are generally uh, very special oils with a very low vapor pressure that do not react well with oxygen. So they're very inert. And they're usually a silicone or a pentaphenyl ether type uh, uh, oil. Now that works very well, but they've actually improved on this basic design by doing what's called a fractionating uh, diffusion pump. So the oil itself will contain a number of different components with different vapor pressures. So as the oil drips down, now you have all, you have the um, oil here on the outside, and then you have small holes leading to the inner tubes of this Christmas tree arrangement. So what happens is that most volatile oils come off in the lower stages, the higher the high, stuff with the highest vapor pressure, as it goes inward, then you are selecting the lower vapor pressure oils. So that up next to your chamber of interest, you have the lowest vapor pressure component of your oil. Okay, so it's just an improvement on the basic design. So almost all diffusion pumps these days are this fractionating design. So as you might imagine, with different gases, you will have different pumping rates. So this big heavy oil molecule, if it hits a really light gas molecule, it's gonna give a lot of downward momentum. It's gonna work very well. If it's a heavy gas molecule, it doesn't work as well. So if you take a look at the pumping speeds, hydrogen and helium pump really well, very light molecules. As you get to the heavier molecules, then your pumping speed decreases. So these are very useful. Uh, they've been used for years, work very well. And you can get, if you trap them well, you can get really good vacuum. Yeah. 
does that mean that there's always an enrichment of nitrogen in certain of these vacuums? Or does the does the concentration of them or whatever you're putting in sort of stay the same? Uh, what, so you're asking, what is the residual gas in yeah. the chamber? Um, generally, the amount of hydrogen and helium is pretty small. So it's still going to be, actually, water vapor tends to be the predominant uh, gas molecule, that and nitrogen. Okay. But it depends on the pressure range you're into. <laughs> so another pump that's used for high vacuum is the turbo molecular pump. And again, you can look at the chart to see the vacuum range that these can uh, attain. So basically, think of it as a jet engine in reverse. You have, you, you spin a rotor very quickly. Any gas molecule that winds up will impinge on the rotor and it will again receive a net downward momentum. So that means you can maintain a pressure differential across this pump. So both the uh, turbo pumps and the diffusion pumps can maintain up to you know 100 200 millitor across the uh, pump which is why you need a roughing pump to exhaust to atmosphere but these pumps will have multiple stages more than just one this shows a typical rotor which has 11 stages to it and you notice that the pitch of the blades varies so the vacuum side will have a steeper pitch the higher pressure side will have a shallower pitch. And again, you have to be thinking about the gas that you're pumping. I learned something recently that these really do not like to pump xenon. The gas molecules are heavy enough that you can actually burn up a pump quite quickly. And the actual construction of these is pretty complex. Uh, they have to have bearings. Most of the modern ones are now magnetically levitated. They have magnetic bearings, which um, helps their lifetime quite a bit. You used to have to pull these apart and maintain them about every 10,000 hours to re-lube the, uh, the oil bearings. In. But as the rotor stops, you still have to maintain the, um, the axial integrity. So uh, they still have oil bearings in them but they're just not used as much. And these are turning at about 40 to 50,000 RPM. So uh, if something goes wrong, it, you can crash the pump very quickly and it's a very ugly sight watching what happens when the rotors hit the stators in there. There's another type of rotating pump known as a molecular drag pump and it's often referred to as a turbo pump. This is, it's a higher pressure variation, but they will often use a screw mechanism in here rather than individual blades. So it's also spinning at 40 or 50,000 RPM, but it'll work at a higher pressure range than a turbo pump. So this can sometimes be used for uh, processing like in a plasma cleaner or something like that. But, um, and in some cases, it's used as a backing pump on a turbo. So there are some manufacturers that build them together to uh, just for efficiency's sake. The um, roots blower is basically for high volumes of gas at a uh, in a rough vacuum. So these are used in industrial processes quite a bit where you don't need a really, really good vacuum, but you got a lot of gas coming through your system. Uh, so it's basically a set of counter-rotating lobed uh, arms. And again, it's a compression technique. So you have a certain compression ratio. They'll multi-stage these things together. And they will use these as um, uh, roughing pumps or backing pumps on other pumps like diffusion pumps in an industrial setting. In a lab, you're unlike, I haven't encountered any of these in a lab environment over my years here. Which move, moves now to what we call entrainment pumps. And I will say, I think the term pump is a little bit misleading. These are traps. 
the gas molecule comes in and it winds up embedded in the walls or in the uh, pumping elements. There's no exhaust on the back. So they don't maintain a pressure differential across the pump. Now the idea here, and this is actually very much like a cold cathode gauge. Your gas molecule comes in, it is ionized, it will hit the titanium and either react with the titanium to form a titanium oxide or whatever, some sort of titanium species, or get buried in the wall of the pump. So these pumps um, will trap the vapor in there. And when they basically, when they're full, you throw them out and you replace the pump. Um, it is possible to rebuild them, replacing all the insides, but that's usually not cost effective these days. So once again, on this type of a pump, the ionization efficiency will determine the effectiveness of the pump. So noble gases will not pump as well as uh, ionizable gases. And you also have to think about this for the ionization gauges, because the gauges are small volumes sitting off the side of your chamber. You're ionizing the gas atoms. So it's at, the gauges themselves are acting as very small pumps. So the pressure inside a gauge can often be better than the pressure out in your chamber. So just to give you an idea, you see there are a couple of different types of pumps. There's various flavors of ion, uh, sputter ion pumps. But when you get down to the uh, noble gases like argon and helium, they generally don't pump. Okay, so you, you wouldn't want to use this to, to pump some sort of a helium type system. Okay, so this is a pump that you have to throw away when it's full. There's another type of entrainment pump called a cryo pump. So here, you're cooling things down to liquid helium temperatures, a few degrees K, Kelvin. Um, when you get down to the condensation point of a gas, you can adsorb those gases onto surfaces very well by the van der Waals forces. So they will use activated charcoal or something to give you a, a nice surface area here. And then they have various uh, cooling elements at different temperatures. So water vapor, yeah, I mean, that'll condense at a very high temp, at a relatively high temperature. But if you want to get down to helium or hydrogen, you need to be down in the few degrees, few Kelvins range. Um, and again, these are entrainment, so they trap the water vapor or the it gas in the pump. The difference between this and an ion pump is that you valve this one off, you let it warm up, and all the gas comes off. So you then have a roughing pump that'll pump away the gas, you cool it down again, and start all over. So to summarize, there are a number of different pumps. And this is from the uh, book by uh, Lewin um, and uh, with some of the comments about strengths and weaknesses of different types of pumps. And if you're interested, I can, uh, I have the book and I can let you uh, take a look at that. So as we're looking at vacuum systems, if you're trying to build a system or working with a system, you need to, can, you know, you have to think about a number of different things. What kind of a volume do you need to evacuate? What kind of gas load are you going to run through that volume? And what kind of gas? So then that will help you decide what kind of pump you need to use. Um, and you, if you look through the catalogs, you'll find that you have different pumps that have different pumping speeds. But as you're doing your design, you also have to take into account what are called the conductance limitations. And Again, I'll mention that and just go through that in just a moment. So now you could be trying to pump down something like this. This was, uh, that's an Apollo upper stage, Apollo rocket upper stage. You're unlikely to have to deal with something at quite this size. Now, maybe after you get out, you might have to do something like this, where this is process gas. So here you have what looks like about a 24 inch diameter oil diffusion pump. Now in the labs, you might find a two inch or a four inch, maybe even a six inch pump. 
that's 24. And I've, I think I've seen up to 48 inch pumps. And looks like in the back, there's a roots blower as the backing pump for that. So this is one where they're trying to, they're running a lot of gas through a chamber. I'm not sure what the process is, but this is a somewhat smaller volume than the uh, rocket chamber, but than the NASA chamber, but you're running a lot more gas through it. So as you're working with these pumps, you remember that they had certain pumping ranges. And as you get down to the lower pressures, your pumping speed, the pumping speed of a pump will, will drop. So these are, uh, this would be a rotary vein pump. As you get down to a few times 10 to the minus three tor, the pumping speed drops. So you cannot handle a gas load at that pressure. Similarly with the uh, diaphragm pumps, it's a somewhat higher value, but you run into, again, this pumping speed limitation. And it's not only the case with um, the uh, mechanical type pumps, the roughing pumps, it's also the case with uh, oil diffusion pumps. As you get down to the lower pressures, you can't put as many gas molecules through it. So again, you have to size your pump and your system for depending what kind of pressure and what kind of gas load you have. So the gas load you have will come from a number of different things. One, if you're doing a process, you're introducing gas deliberately into the system, but you can also have leakage, which is uh, undesirable gas introduced into the system. So you if you have a hair on an O-ring or something like that, or you don't have something sealed well, uh, you'll get external leakage. There are what we call virtual leaks. So if you're assembling something in a vacuum for a vacuum chamber, you want to make sure you don't have any trapped volumes. So one of the uh, traditional ones is you have screws, you put them into a hole, but at the bottom of the screw hole, there's a little trapped volume of air and it leaks out for a long time past the threads. So you have to make sure you either drill a hole through the screw to let the gas out, or you, you have an open hole at the bottom. Backflow would be uh, not so much affecting the vacuum level, as the cleanliness of your vacuum. So again, if you have an oil diffusion pump, you might get oil molecules uh, drifting back up, which would contaminate your system. So uh, we talk about contamination in the microscope. The early microscopes used uh, oil diffusion pumps and the cold trap was there to condense all those oil molecules so that they wouldn't affect your, uh, your sampling and your imaging. Evaporation and desorption, um, you will wind up with water vapor on the walls adsorbed to the walls of your chamber. So that will come off as you start getting into the high vacuum range, uh, mostly as desorption. But for the rest, that's more in the way of ultra high vacuum. And by warming the chamber, you can accelerate the desorption of these molecules. So people will often bake their chambers up to maybe 150 degrees C to improve the vacuum and to help it pump down faster. When you get to diffusion and permeation, again, that's an ultra high vacuum problem. Uh, they, you can actually get diffusion along grain boundaries in flanges. So for ultra high vacuum, they'll cross forge and do all sorts of things to break up the leakage paths through the solid flange. Now, a generic vacuum system would be something like this. You have a vacuum chamber that you're trying to evacuate. You will have some sort of a high vacuum pump, whether a diffusion pump, turbo molecular, and a, then a four pump, you know, to uh, exhaust the gas out of the atmosphere, or a cryo pump, or an ion getter pump, in which case you don't have this backing line here. You just use the four pump to rough pump the chamber. And the rough pump can be, you know, any one of these pumps. So you notice now that you'll have usually have some sort of a high vacuum valve and your pump is now attached to that. So the pump is not usually directly on the chamber. You also have then valves to um, allow you to change the pumping path. And you, you then have tubing, plumbing, vacuum plumbing, we refer to it. But the, just like water pipes, you have a certain conductance for these um, 
uh, for the vacuum plumbing. So if we start thinking about conductance, this is very similar to Ohm's law. We're just thinking of the other side of the coin. Instead of resistance, we're thinking conductance. So when you have things in series, so here's my chamber, here's my pump, you have some sort of a connecting tube, your conductance will add like so. So to take an example, suppose you have a pump that's rated for 500 liters per second. And you have a pipe that's also rated for 500 liters per second. If you calculate it, now, by the time you get to the chamber, you actually only have 250 liters per second pumping speed. So you have to be thinking about the plumbing between your pump and the object you're trying to pump out, your chamber. So if you think about it, if you put a really narrow tube in here that has a very small conductance, that's going to dominate the, uh, the pumping speed by the time it gets to the chamber. And you can use that sometimes deliberately for differential pumping. So you can maintain a pressure differential. And in our microscopes, uh, we actually do have a differential pumping aperture at the bottom of the column because we used to put in uh, film in the bottom chamber which was always very wet, a lot of outgassing, uh, de you know, desorption. So you'd have a very high pressure down in the projection chamber and you'd want a very good pressure up around your sample. So we would use a very small um, uh, orifice there, which had poor conductance. So, and then in parallel, your conductance is add. Okay. So in the different pressure ranges, uh, we will have what we call different flow rates. So we will define these in terms of viscous flow, and that's back on that early chart where you have the different uh, Knudsen numbers. So water pipe would be viscous flow, and the conductance goes as R to the fourth over L. So it varies as the fourth power, which means that if you just increase your diameter slightly, you get a lot more flow. As your pressure drops and you get to the molecular flow range, where the mean free path of the molecule is on the same order as your uh, dimensions of your pipe or whatever you have, then your conductance will go more as R cubed over L. So, and then there's a transition region in between, but just in broad strokes, that's, that's what, we, what we have. So, okay. We have to get through these ranges, and now we have to build our system. So we're going to be using various seals to hold all these bits and pieces together. And we can use elastomers, O-rings, or we can use metal seals. The metal seals are used for the ultra-high vacuum in general. Um, because the, actual, the permeability of an O-ring becomes a problem. You get gas diffusing through the uh, rubber compound. So a basic O-ring system would be like this. You just have this little groove here. You put your flange down on it and you compress the O-ring. The O-rings are generally compressed to 70% of their original diameter. They're not squished completely flat. Um, and there are different materials for O-rings that all have different advantages and disadvantages. So again, broad strokes, we're not gonna go into all the details there. What you find commonly these days are ISO flanges, which are pretty similar to the illustration on the left, but what are called quick flanges, uh, which are usually called either KF, which was the original German designation, or QF, which is kind of common now, QF for quick flange, I think. But those consists of two flat flanges with a centering ring, and your O-ring is mounted on the centering ring. So the ring itself has a certain thickness, which gives you your, how much the O-ring is compressed and avoids uh, over-compressing. But the flanges themselves have tapered edges. So as you clamp this, put this clamp around the outside and clamp in, it forces the uh, flanges together and gives you your compression. So these are pretty quick and easy. You don't have to worry about you know, different, um, matching up different flanges because they're both flat. You don't have two grooves or two flats trying to match them up together. 
So those are very common these days and are used on most of the instrumentation that we have here. But as I said, the elastomers have certain permeability. So you get leakage past those O-rings. So to get the better vacuums, we will often go to metal seals. Metal seals can also withstand a higher temperature. So if you want to bake out a system, you'll use metal seals. And the most common is known as a conflat or CF. Conflat is a trademark of uh, Varian who came up with it in the late 50s. But basically, it's a piece of OFHC copper that is clamped between two knife edges. So as you clamp down, this taper here forces the copper out, but it's trapped by the edge of the uh, flange. So you can wind up with extremely high pressures on the surface there, and it uh, then um, seals very well with that high pressure. So you, they, they, and he treat these, oh, these gaskets very carefully, but they're single use gaskets. You use them once and you throw them away. Well, you recycle the, the copper, it's too expensive to throw away. So, but you usually have a, a set of bolts around the outside and you have to tighten them in just the right order so you don't get it uh, kind of skew. But uh, these are very useful um, for, uh, for ultra high vacuum. Oops. So as we're thinking, getting to ultra high vacuum now, we want to start thinking about surfaces maybe. You can actually go to the kinetic theory of gases, work out the energy, three halves KT, which is the same as the uh, one half MV squared. You can calculate the momentum change as a molecule hits the wall. You can take your Avogadro's number, know how many molecules there are, and do a quick back of the envelope calculation such that at 10 to the minus six torr, assuming a sticking coefficient of one, you'll get about one monolayer per second deposit within, you know, small factor. So that means that at atmosphere, you've got about a nanosecond before your uh, surface is, co is covered with other molecules. Yeah, maybe two nanoseconds, I don't know. But it's unlikely that you're going to be uh, able to work and do anything at that speed. So to actually look at surfaces, you need to be at least about one times 10 to the minus nine torr because that gives you about 20 minutes, about a thousand seconds. So it, depending on the surface that you're looking at, if you need to actually look at the atomic layers at the surface, you need to be sort of one times 10 to the minus nine or better vacuum. And that I think for right now is about where I'd like to end. I mean, I've really touched just on very basic stuff. Um, and I will put up the references again for your, uh, uh, so that you can see that. I'd be glad to answer any questions either now or later on. Yes. Can you comment on the efficiency uh, consumption of these pumps, the energy consumption? The, the what? The efficiency and the energy consumption. Oh, the energy cost of pumps? No. <laughs> I mean, oil diffusion pumps have usually, you know, a 500 watt heater on them. And then you're dumping a lot of heat into the water. So you have a cooling water thing as well. Um, but turbo pumps, you're running them at 40 or 50,000 RPM, but you need to have a backing pump. So you'd have to look at the actual current draw on each one. Uh, so, and usually it's more the purpose that is defining how you, what kind of pump you're going to use rather than the energy cost. That's usually the secondary, would be a secondary issue. If there's anyone online that has questions, you can type those in, or if you want to bring your hand, we can unmute you, that kind of stuff as well. So we'll hang out for a few minutes for questions. Yeah. 
you told me what's the, the, the absolute limit, what is the highest that you mm -hmm. And the where, best where can we need it? Outer space. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to a new problem. Um, people have gotten down to 10 to the minus 12, I believe. Uh, but that's usually in a very small volume. And they're doing things like actually cooling the chamber with liquid helium. Mm -hmm. So they're condensing everything on the walls of the, <laughs> of the chamber as well. They're using the chamber as a pump. But yeah, it, it's... About 10 to minus 12 is about the lowest I've seen as far as vacuum levels go. That's in TOR. And it's, uh, for which applications would you need? Yeah. Well, it would be looking at um, some like catalytic actions. If you're actually interested in what's happening atomically on a surface, You'd, you'd want that kind of uh, vacuum level so that you have a long time to look at it, watch reactions taking place and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about atomic level surfaces at this point. Yeah, the term surface is a fairly ill-defined one because it depends on, are you interested in the atomic, you know, the absolute atomic layer, the first micron, the first millimeter, you know, yeah. A civil engineer might only be interested in the first, you know, centimeter or so, right? And that would be surface for him. Do you have a favorite pump? Hmm? Do you have a favorite type of pump, or like a personal? <laughs> a favorite type of pump, one that works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, they again, it, it depends, you know, what's your favorite kind of car? Depends whether I have to haul wood or kids, you know, you don't throw kids into, well, we don't throw kids into the back of the pickup truck <laughs> these days anyway. <laughs> kind of depends. If I have to do a maintenance on it, a rotary vein pump. That oil is just a pain in the neck. But I've uh, an oil diffusion pump. If you crack the oil, um, the uh, Santavac type oils are a polyphenol ether. And if you crack the oil by exposing it to air while it's hot, you, you put a phenolic plastic all over the Christmas tree. And you have to sandblast that off. And it stinks to high heaven because of the phenol in it. <laughs> That's also unpleasant. So it's more the rebuilds and the cleaning that define my least favorite pump. Um, what's yeah. the life expectancy of the pumps that? have the gases on there, like, like the iron pump, for example. So the iron pump, it depends on the gas load. So on, the, on our microscopes, we will run cryocycles, right? Because as you're loading samples, you're, put, you're introducing water vapor and other gases into the, into the column. So the water vapor in particular will condense immediately on that cold finger. Uh, the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at nitrogen temperatures is about 10 to the minus 12 torr. I mean, really low. But what happens now when that warms up? Now all that gas comes back off. If you are using the ion pump to pump it, it just gets embedded in the wall of the pump. But if you turn off the ion pump and use the turbo pump to pull away that gas, now you're extending the life of the pump. Also, the ion pump can't handle the rapid gas load of the warming cold figure, cold trap. So you'll often overload an ion pump. Uh, and at higher pressures, because you're in, you have these energetic ions, you're embedding them in the wall of the pump. Where does that energy go? Heat. I've actually had ion pumps hot enough I could sizzle water on. They don't pump too well at that temperature, and you know you don't want to get them that hot. So, um, 
So you can easily overload an ion pump with, by uh, putting in too much gas. So for the overload and the lifetime of the pump, you will use usually the turbo pump to pump away that excess gas. So they almost never exist by themselves, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So then, I mean, because we run the cryo cycle, right, every day on the, on the TF20 and the T30, but we rarely ever do that, right? I don't even know if we we do. We do. On the, we do. On but look, what is the different size doer? The doer that's on the Tech 9s will last maybe six hours if everything's really nice and cold. Yeah. It will not last overnight. Yeah. We've got big doers on the Titans that'll last four days, or just about four days. Mm -hmm. So we just keep refilling it until, and then periodically, okay, it's been so long, or somebody dumped the column then we'll run a cryo cycle, okay? But yeah, periodically we'll warm it up, pump away the gas and start fresh. Okay. Yeah. Once a month, once every two months, something like that. Again, depending on how many samples have gone through and what kind of users we've had. <laughs> Uh, oh, the, the cold finger? Infinite. Or as close to infinite, you know, as, as a microscope can be. I mean, you're not doing any reaction to the cold trap that's in there. It's just a block of copper or brass. Yeah. Okay. I didn't see anything online, so All right. thanks again, Hank. Sure. Great talk. And everyone that's in person, there's still putting some more donuts outside. Anyone that's online, you should come in person. Usually we have coffee and donuts here. See you guys. Thanks.